So I definitely got dropped into a multi-dimensional space with Aya and it made me pretty much lose it. I didn't know how to process it um, and I moved to Central America for two years and didn't know how to really take it on, but it was um, just seeing so many layers of the universe at once and infinite amounts of beings and creatures and spirits and layers and kind of having this understanding that aliens and ETs and all these spirits, it's not some faraway thing. Like we're all kind of living in this multi-dimensional web together. Hi, welcome to Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super awesome podcast interview show that me, your artist friend Chris Dyer, does to interview his super awesome, interesting artist friends. Today, I'm interviewing my good old friend, Ashley Spiro. She has been this really interesting artist that has come to a couple of my retreats in the jungle, and we've become friends uh, over these years and this week she is spending some time in Kilmana in my land here in uh, close to Lima, Peru. How are you doing Ashley? Hey Chris, I'm doing great. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. T tell me a little bit where we are right now. Um, we're at your awesome space surrounded by flowers and cactus and this awesome retreat space that you're building and I was super psyched to be the first artist residency and come paint my paint juju on this awesome wall here. And Yeah, thank you. It's, yeah. Uh, basically, right now, it's still far from being a, a, a retreat space or community spot. Right now, it's my family retirement home that I come every winter to spend just time with my parents. But, you know... As somebody who has a lot of awesome artist friends, my dream is to bring all my artist friends and you're the first one. Woo! Yeah! So stoked. And so far you're doing an amazing uh, job on this uh, little mural piece. You're not done yet. You'll finish this afternoon before you fly back home tomorrow. So thank you so much to start with this. Yeah. I uh, hope you had a good time. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a, we've gone through quite a journey these past few weeks and it's been really beautiful and enlightening and ups and downs and highs and lows and amazing journey yeah, yeah well thank you once again for simply by, by by painting this but also for just being my friend especially at a hard time like i'm uh, spending through these last few weeks uh but we won't get into that too much let's keep it airy and happy as usual so let's start with some basics please tell me what is your art about you're like a really interesting weird crazy kind of person and your art comes as an explosion of energy what is it all about um i've been channeling shapes and symmetry since i was really young and it started as just a way for me to process the world and i just uh, i started making symmetry in my sketchbook when i was going through hard times when i was a kid and it just kind of carried me through and it's just evolved and um, definitely at the beginning, it wasn't about like being an artist or really anything to do with that. It was just my way to take the world and put it in a way that made sense to me. Um, and it's very much channeled. Um, I think for me, it's the more I can just flow and not let my headspace get into it and kind of flow through my heart, the more, um, it, it touches me and I hope that it touches others as well. Um. Yeah, it's definitely a channeling of color and shape and form. And I've spent, you know, the majority of my life doing it. And it, it kind of feeds through its art. And it's it's so much more than that. It's like how energy moves and my way to 
figure out color and how color interacts with the world and how emotion interacts with the world. Um, and I think that's what we're all trying to do, just figure out how our energy interacts with everything. And it's just my way to do that. Nice. Yeah. Uh, you, you're mentioning the word channeling that some people might not understand. What does channeling mean? To me, channeling is something that comes from other places and uh, it moves through me. So I kind of feel like in this space, it's like a deep meditation. So I become like a hollow vessel for for things to kind of just come through and move. And I know that um, some of the beings and spirits um, come through me from other places. I'm not going to try to put my finger on exactly where those places are, but they feel ancient and futuristic and from all different realms and fairies and gnomes and ETs and plant spirits are really big for me. I've worked with a lot of different plants and I feel like the more I work with different energies in the world, the more they kind of move through and become a part of my paint process. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, it seems from the conversations I had with you that your each painting you do has a specific code which is about healing somebody and then the person that buys that painting uh, interacts with that specific code that you've created. Can you tell me a little about that? I'm just kind of learning about that but it's really interesting because I feel like certain people are so drawn to one painting and I kind of have like an intuition for it like there's some sort of healing that someone is looking for and I've had a lot of people buy my art that are like this is so weird I've never bought a painting before they don't really some of them you know aren't familiar with vision a art they just feel called to the color combination in some way and I hope that that serves as a personal portal to their healing and I I believe in some sort of divine framework and multi-dimensional web and I believe that everything everything you do and all your intentions are all woven together so I really believe that these pieces are meant to go to a certain place and I'm just kind of I'm doing the work but I also feel like it's kind of just moving through me and I'm just like trying to be as open and accepting as I can to let what needs to go to the different places go give healing to where it needs to go yeah super if nice that makes sense yeah totally <laughs> i hope that every painting yeah. you do is a uh, specific uh, medicine for the person that receives it i hope so so what's your relationship with insects and this is a two-parter what's the difference between insects and cell phones Oh, you're going to bring it back to that one. Sure, why not? So <laughs> this is a very particular um, plant journey I had with ayahuasca where she put me into the insect kingdom. And the beginning of the experience was about I had all these insects coming and like working on me and doing surgery and like all these different insect kingdoms. Um, and I had a past life journey where I was this older woman and she would speak through the insects and the insects would speak to her and they would fly off and gather information and come back. And I had this kind of revelation. I've always been one that was like really against technology. Like it took me a long time to accept it. Um, it always kind of turned me off. It felt like it was fake and I was like the last one to get a cell phone and I was just like I feel like this is a bad vibe and slowly I've realized that you can transmit healing through this and there is a way to use technology for good so that's been a slow and potent revelation but um I I had this moment where the sound of the insect sounded just like the buzz of technology it was like <laughs> Um, and the vibration that the cell phone was giving me was so similar to what the insects were showing me. Um, and so really what I got from this one experience was that, like, it's okay. Like, it's part of the divine plan. Like, there's a vibrational energy that's in alignment with all that is that is in technology. Um, so really, and also a big message from that was the addictive nature of technology, how it is something that is 
huge in our culture right now of people needing to like look at their phones and it's a big plague on us. So a really big transmission I got from that is to go and like listen to the insects. For all the time you spend staring at your phone, go listen to nature. It will like reset you. So that like tweakiness and that like uncomfortableness of staring at your phone, like go out in and just listen to the sounds of nature for as long as you spend staring at your screen. And hopefully those two things can kind of balance each other out and we don't become a bunch of tweaky creatures. <laughs> yeah, like it's a really the balance, the balance is important. Very cool. Yeah. So if you got the ability to like communicate with insects and uh, listen to these gnomes or little creatures that then like get into your paintings. Would you say you got some degree of psychic powers? Uh, what, what's your, the psychedelic world of Spiro? Don't be afraid to say your truth. I'm still coming to grips with that. And I, I mean, I do have very tuned in. Um, I've spent pretty much my whole life on the plant medicine journey. And the spiritual journey, like it's always been a part of my radar. Um, I was blessed to have my aunt and uncle who do peyote ceremony when I was really young. So that was brought into my life. Um, I was an herbalist. I've always been into like collecting different plants and making medicines from different plants. And I just have looked at plants as like the ultimate spiritual teacher always. And so whenever there's something in my life that has a lesson to teach me. I always go back to the plants. Um, so yeah, I think I've definitely developed those those skills and that like innate energy. Um, I think it's still growing and I think it's something that is important to just be conscious of the way that we're putting out there into the world and uh, and constantly be on the path of growth and discovery and constantly be open because as soon as you're sure that you're a psychic or you're sure that you're a healer or you like think that you know something, the universe is gonna come in and like chop your feet from under you right. and put you back into the abyss where you're like, I don't know anything at all. <laughs> so as much as I fine tune these skills and I get to these, these peaks in my life where I'm like oh my gosh I understand this all fits together and I can hear these spirits and these creatures and um there's always there's always room for developing and finding new ways to process and but I do have a lot of spirit guides so they're helping me on this journey beautiful yeah. it seems like every time we get to a certain level of evolution or a spiritual path the spiritual path itself humbles us to know that we ain't we ain't shit and there's so much more to go through. Absolutely. I, I remember one night, I think like after the third or fourth uh, ayahuasca ceremony of the, the retreat we just did, you got a big connection with your alien tribe. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your connection with aliens? Yeah. <laughs> Is that a hard question? Um, no, but I definitely, okay, so I definitely got dropped into a multidimensional space with Aya, and I had been there before, um, and I had been dropped into this multidimensional space in my early 20s, and it made me pretty much lose it. I didn't know how to process it, um, and I moved to Central America for two years and didn't know how to really take it on, but it was um, just seeing so many layers of the universe at once and infinite amounts of beings and creatures and spirits and layers and kind of having this understanding that aliens and ETs and all these spirits, it's not some faraway thing. Like we're all kind of living in this multidimensional web together. It's just as we evolve, we're starting to see each other more and more. Like the veils are getting thin and I also see it as kind of like you're here and there's like infinite doorways on every direction and you can kind of sway and like move in and see these beings and these spirits and then you move in and see these and it kind of gets wider and wider. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just an infinite and it, 
I think to where it used to be kind of scary, at this point it's just like, wow, Beautiful. there's infinite possibility out there. And we have a lot of things that we are dealing with as humans on the planet in this 3D world that we really need to pay attention to. Um, our Earth and our planet and Pachamama, like that's our planet and that's our Earth. And that's why we're here and that's our focus. But also, there's like an infinite layered multi-dimensional world of energies that we've only begun to like scratch the surface of like we we have so much potential in our growth um so yes saving the planet is is what we should all be 100 percent focused on right now and also feel supported that there's infinite other layers and beings and energies that are on our side to do that um and feel you can call on your spirit guides and you can call into the other dimensions. And we all have our own connection and special powers to tap into different entities that can help us along the way. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. I, I always envy people like you that can see further past the physical plane. Um, it seems like a gift, but it also seems like a curse because when you're young and you don't know what's going on and you're seeing all these things past the physical plane, it might make you feel a little bit like you're, you're going crazy. And when you tell normal people, um, it's just kind of like a, a hard thing to grasp or to explain and people might even judge you or might say that, you, that you're crazy. Um, yeah, and you know, I've always been kind of like, the weird one and out there and I didn't always speak my opinion I think part of the reason why I felt like I was crazy wasn't because I was talking about these things it's because I wasn't talking about these things mm -hmm. because I was staying quiet and I wasn't speaking my truth and I wasn't standing in my power um, and I think that's something that we can be aware of as artists and as creatives like we're here to empower people we're here to make like imagination is something really interesting to me because we all have imagination and how much of your imagination is truth and how much of it is abstract and I kind of it's all black there's no black and white everything is all swirling around all the time so like believing in yourself and believing in in others and just expansion instead of squishing things just keep believing and keep imagining and creating your own reality and more portals will open up for you and more possibilities will open up for you and the world will become bigger and brighter beautiful yeah, yeah. that's a great message i think like uh, more people should believe in a world past the little you know realm that we can perceive in the physical plane and uh as you can, as you just said, there's just so many dimensions and aspects and portals past what we can see. And uh, to be able to capture that and to bring it onto paintings is uh, our gift or our service to humanity as visionary artists or whatever label you want to throw on it. Now, from knowing you, I can see you are a very erratic kind of painter who, who can't just well, I don't know if you can't, but you don't seem to focus on one painting. You start a painting, you mess around, you let it go. You go to the next one, you mess around, you push things around, you let it go. You jump onto the next one and so on. Uh, tell me a little bit about your process in painting. Well, it's going back to that channel and just like staying with the flow of energy and as much as I can like not let my thoughts get in the way of it, like as much as I can just feel the flow of energy moving and just kind of let it happen and let it flow and, and feel it out. I mean, sometimes I pick a color because it's the color closest to my hand. And I use as much of that color as happens to dump out on the palette. And I use whatever brush I grab out of the thing. Like, it, it's, it's... It seems like you don't think about it. In the much. moment. I really try to stay in the moment. It's my meditation practice of, like, staying focused in the moment. And the more that I... I'm an overthinker. And without painting, I'm a huge overthinker. I will sit there and decompress and, and dissect everything and pull it apart into little tiny pieces. And when I'm painting, my mind just gets quiet and everything becomes more clear and I'm feeling from my heart and I'm able to like 
take in the world. The world has always been so overwhelming for me. Like everything about the world, even when I was a kid, I didn't know how to handle it. I was just like, everything was always too overwhelming. But being able to like take in those things through moving them through my body and figuring out my emotions and having them come out just makes everything feel calmer and clearer and I'm able to express myself and without having to um, explain, I guess. Yeah. So it seems like uh, art is your medicine for yourself, but it's also the medicine you offer others once they buy it or take it into their lives. A hundred percent. I mean, I made art for like years six or seven years like living in a mud hut I lived in a mud hut by myself without power and electricity I lived in a teepee I lived in Central America like I made art for so long just because I needed to heal myself it wasn't about like who's gonna buy this or what do I do with it I just like I needed to figure out where I stood and what I was just healing for myself and so then to discover like took me kind of a while to be like oh other people like this like this can heal other people too that's cool and that kind of like started my journey of really you know making art so um, cool huh? right so great when you can double down on healing for you and healing for others for since sure. others are ourselves for sure and I think the different mediums like I went to school for metal sculpture mm -hmm. so the first art I did was like no colors and it was like heavy and manual and it was like the energy I needed to get out so I feel like having that transfer to painting and color and it just makes me think of like dance and like any any practice that anyone does in that way of like moving energy through and sharing it beautiful and now that you paint what mediums do you use mostly acrylic I've been getting into oil um, but I always paint on wood I've always like felt a connection to wood. My grandfather was a wood carver um, and I've always just, my house is made out of all wood and there's something that's like alive about the piece of wood. I feel like um, when I first started making art, it was about bringing out the soul of the wood and the spirit, like wood is, was a tree and this tree had a spirit. So if I'm bringing through these spirits and paint, like I have to trace it back, like the wood I'm painting on and the brush I'm using and you're, it's all a spirit and you're all interacting with different spirits. So I love painting on wood too. And my first paintings when I got out of school was on uh, broken skateboards, which was both wood, but wood that had been utilized by, you know, people who were having adventures with this plank of wood. And then it, when I paint on it, it would bring all this amazing energy out of the combination of human and the nature spirit that hopefully we can, you know, keep forever. Um, so you, you don't you uh, I know you use a little bit of markers uh, on your on your on your paintings. What's your what's your perspective on markers? It's pretty new. I actually um, shout out Gavinder. Um, my roommate use them a lot and so I started dabbling with them and yeah I think they're a great tool I don't know I've been trying to be more open because I went to art school and so ugh, art school was different from the visionary art world like they hated symmetry which is funny because I like do symmetry but I was very like traditionalist in my practices and like you know, but now I feel like I'm like, you know, whatever, whatever new medium comes up, that's fair to use. And so, yeah, why not try everything? Yeah. But you would use you it want. on a canvas, but not on a mural. Um, you know, I'm pretty new to them. So I'm kind of just like figuring out where they fit and where they don't. But more often than not, I do feel like I can't get that the feeling of a brush on a surface is something I just love so much. And I haven't found like that tactile. And for me, it kind of comes back to like the feeling of it sometimes more than the final product. Mm -hmm. Like it's about like if I'm transmitting the best energy that I can transmit, it's like how does that, that brush feel on that wood? How does it glide? How does it move? How does that color look? Or just the personality of the line work that you can do with a brush where you can go from thin to thick right. and round it out. Right. It's like that flow. And so, I yeah, I All think right. brush is better. 
Nice, me too. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes markers can bring that little bit of a detail that's just quicker than sure. using a brush. Sure. Um, you told me that you live in a cabin in nature in North Carolina. Tell me a little bit of where you live and what's your dreams for that place. Um, so I landed myself in this epic, beautiful little wood cabin on a couple acres in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And I, it just feels like home. I love it. Um, it's this old wood cabin with a river running next to it. And I've had dreams since I was like 10 or 11 years old of having a sculpture garden. I've always wanted to have this like epic sculpture garden. And also I was, uh, I traveled around doing artist residencies and farm work when I was younger. So I would go to all these different places um, my parents also like took in exchange students and kids. So I've always felt this calling to like create this space where people could come and feel supported and feel inspired um, and have some free space to create. And so I've, I've always known that was a part of my path and it keeps being more and more kind of clear where I'm going with that. And yeah, um, psychedelic sculpture garden slash healing space. Um, I want to have international artist residencies. I want to bridge, you know, world communities because kind of our scene is really big in the U.S. when there's so many other super, super talented kids around the world that could benefit from coming. And um, yeah, I it's really similar to your vision here. I think we have very similar visions. And being able to host workshops and retreats and just have that art transcends the canvas. Like it's how you live your life. Right. It's it how becomes you, a community. It's how you decorate. It's like your whole space. You're calling in these different energies. Like I know I'm moving around the space in my house and I'm like, okay, this painting portal needs to go here and this sculpture has to go here. And it's a way of, beyond just moving energy through me onto the canvas, it's about moving energy in the world into different things. And you can use that. And I always feel like my sculpture is like an acupuncture for the earth. Like the sculpture kind of goes and it's this totem um, and it holds a certain energy and it helps to heal and move through. And um, yeah, and I hope to have other sculptors. I, I'm really, really excited it's been 10 years um, since I got a sculpture degree and it was so hard to bring this medium through because it's heavy and I was always a traveler and I'm like starting this new chapter of being able to do sculpture again. And I think, you know, visionary art sculpture is not a very, it's, I think it's a new like art in public spaces, you know, in the park. Um, and in nature where people can interact with it. And I'm really totally passionate about that. Have you been to Cosm yet? Um, I went to the Hall of Sacred Mirrors in New York City. Okay. I stumbled upon it by accident when I was in college. Um, and yeah, but I look forward to visiting Cosm. Nice. Well, yeah. I, I'd say... My future dream for this place, not that it's anywhere close to doing because right now it's my parents' retirement place and I'm not about to stomp into their situation. But like eventually, as you know, this is something that goes into the future with myself. It's the same as, as you, like a place for community, for getting together, for doing art, for healing, for ceremony. And uh, I myself have been inspired on what uh, Alex and Allison have been doing out there in Cosm. Their thing is uh, at a larger scale. Like I, you know, I'm not trying to like do the biggest thing. I just want to do a little offering as you also. And as you say, we can do a painting and then our life is our painting. But then our life transcends just our life. It transcends the people we meet and the community that we create, bringing people together, creating a bigger, bigger painting. So I think these uh, spaces are very necessary um, uh, offerings for the healing of humanity totally. as we move into the future. Totally. Um, so tell me a little bit about your path with plant medicine. You told me that your uncle was a peyote shaman, right? 
Yeah, he was a medicine man, and my aunt and uncle practiced Native American church, so I got to be exposed to that when I was really young. Um, and I guess that kind of set the trajectory, but I think it was just always, any time like, something like that was brought into my view, I always just felt so at home. Before, it was like really in, like, the festival scene was a little bit different because I felt like, it, it didn't have the same sort of container. So that was like an interesting thing to navigate. How it was different and seeing these different plant medicines used in that way. Um, but yeah, plant medicine. I mean, I worked as an herbalist. Um, I sold my art at herbal conferences. Uh, the Western North Carolina mountains have so much herbal medicine. So, so what's many, an herbalist? Like, I don't know what an herbalist is. Um, someone who takes plants and makes tinctures and makes um, like traditional folk herbal medicine, not just for psychedelic use, but just for general health. Some kind of witchery. Like, yeah, <laughs> witchcraft. Modern witchcraft. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's taking responsibility for your own health. It's, you know, our Western medicine system is, is pretty messed up. Like, right. it's awful. Like, pharmaceutical and big pharma and the way people take a pill for things it's so off track for where we need to be as humans right now and there's such a vast array of plants for everything in your body like if you start to study herbs they look like the organs that they affect like walnuts are good for your brain and um you're putting me on the spot to like you know have specific herbs but it, it's it's just a really infinite amount of knowledge and it's a lost art and there's a lot of people, I think it's it's having a huge rise right now. I hope with corona, it's having a huge rise. People are taking some responsibility for their health and learning about the plants in their area, like they're at home. So I hope they're in their gardens and learning what plants call to them and like trust that. Like and boost their immune system. Intuition and plant knowledge are the same. Like you can sit there and read a textbook of this plant does this and I take it this many times in this dose but like it's really they speak to you Psych psychedelic plants are not or just the flower that's sitting on your shelf in your house like plants speak to you on an energetic level and if you can the more you practice it the more they'll speak to you and they're our allies they've been here way before we were and they'll they'll be here long after we're gone and plant vibrational energy is just here to help us and so well, I know you don't like this term, the curandero or the curandera, uh, but it sounds like you're a curandera of some sorts who uses the, the medicine of nature to bring it to the people so they can heal from nature. And I know that's a very, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe intriguing kind of term or very South America term, but it's... I know, noticed it's, that I'm still young. Like, I'm mature in my path because I've studied really hard, but like to... A true plant medicine person has dedicated their entire lives, and I think that's where the elders come in. So, yeah, as an elder, yeah, I think I'll have, like, a very vast knowledge, and I think it's important to keep learning and keep growing and learning from people that know more. And, yeah, I, I hope to offer medicine in those ways. Um, and, yeah, time will tell what exactly, you know, I think, the words shaman and curandero and ayahuasquero, I honor that culture so much. Um, it's, it's constantly changing. And I just think with plant medicines coming in to the States, it's time for us to reevaluate. It's time for us to be really conscious about where we want these things to fall. It's time to have a level head about them. It's time to have the balance of the masculine and the feminine, the cactus and the vine, which you've, that's been a huge, you know, our journey these past few weeks, a, a huge theme for me as in my soul and as a person has been working with um, peyote cactus medicine and wachuma cactus which medicine. Which is very male. Which is more masculine and working with the vine, ayahuasca, which is very feminine. It's really helped guide me in my own path, and I believe we all have elements of the masculine and the feminine, and plant medicine can help balance this um, a lot. And I just, I, I think it's a really poignant thing coming up in our society right now. 
Right. And I think it's something that is imbalanced in in so many levels of our culture. Like there's so many imbalances um, and we're learning. We're learning. We're all learning how to figure that out um, and start, you know, gender identity and the roles of men and women. And I think in our generation, it's just been something that constantly comes up and we all just are trying to stay open and do the best we can and um, have all have voices heard. And there's so much to be said that it's hard to say. There's right. so much to speak for it on this topic. Like it's just it's so seems like every decade or even every you said generation, but generation is what defined every decade or two has new lessons, new uh, vocabulary, new yeah. ways of approaching yeah, and these we're, things. Yeah, and we're tearing down the patriarchy right now. Women's empowerment is at the forefront of our society. Like, that is what we've been working on. We're tearing down the patriarchy. It, it has so many dark fingers twisted around our world, and we're tearing that up, and we're breaking it down, and feminine power is rising, and then it's time to heal the masculine. Right. It's time to go into the masculine wounds and heal the masculine. And um, Right, because it seems like like it's, it's good to tear down the masculine in order to rise the feminine, but sometimes it seems like well, it also goes out of balance. Well, it's not tearing down, it's just exposing darkness, like exposing truth. But and sometimes we crush the masculine in order to rise the feminine, but it should, like, we're trying to find that balance between where we both can be at the same level. I don't both know, it's empowered. about crushing it. It's just about, like, showing those shadows. Like, we've had so many things swept under the rug and been in shadow and voices unheard, and every, every woman has felt unheard at some point in her journey she's felt unheard and she wasn't able to speak her voice and we need to heal that it's a huge wound and the the feminine and the softness and the healing that comes from that is something our society really needs and i also think the feminine is about raw expression and emotion and getting to just speak and getting to move that energy through where i feel like masculine energy is a bit more about like taking the space and stepping back and trying to figure things out more logically and coming to a conclusion and i mean it's all a part of the same whole um fine for balance yeah we're just trying to meet in the middle like yeah. i think us men are trying to find more of our feminine side us to be softer and uh, have more emotion while uh, maybe the females um, or the women um, are trying to like maybe also see why us men are a certain way or maybe how we can heal the wounds that make men act in unbalanced ways. Um, because obviously men act in an unbalanced way. It's a big conversation, and, and, and to find solutions on this little conversation between you and me is a big challenge. But that's kind of like what we've up, been up to in the last three weeks, even before the it's big It's hard not to talk about it. Like, right. it's a huge, deep conversation. And even right now, I wonder, like, am I saying the right thing? Because I've always been a huge voice for female empowerment. That has been a huge part of my journey. But I also have been, I think, more comfortable with my masculine girl. I was a very masculine kid. Like, I think I've very much, like, and who knows, maybe I was masculine because of the patriarchy and I was trying to match this ideal of the patriarchy and that's a blind spot or a wound within me. But I've also felt very feminine and unheard and disrespected and not honored so many times. And so I have, I have empathy and... Um, man, it's just such a, uh, a weighted thing. And I think we all are navigating that. And, um, right. Totally. Um, as a man that grew up in Peru, the country we are right now, that's a very masculine, macho country. You're supposed to be a certain way. You're supposed to not touch your feminine side. To touch your feminine side is wrong. It's uh, laughed upon. And uh, I feel we miss out on something when you're just pushed into this box and not find uh, 
the sensitivity that comes with being uh, in your in the female aspect of yourself to try to empathize and see um, the other side of the coin and the uh, the women we interact with. So that's something that I'm myself I'm healing in myself right now and trying to learn how to become a man that can listen to women more and uh, while at the same time still standing in my uh, masculine aspect and, and uh, using that strength for good if possible and empowering uh, my female friends to also stand in their masculine aspect that has that strength and power to fight through. And the, the only next way it's chapter. about that sensitivity. So the only way you're going to learn it is listening to the feminine. Right. And that's 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 your way to heal is just to open and listen to the feminine and put yourself aside and listen to the voice of the feminine within yourself and the the people around you and. Mm -hmm. um, we it's for all it's medicine for all you know it's medicine for everyone right it's a life journey and i'm very grateful for having you this week and all my female friends i think most of my friends i are women these days and they have so many lessons to teach me um yeah and so let's go back to to psychedelics <laughs> which is a fun topic it's more of a fun topic uh, but it's still interwined because we're talking about the cactus, yeah. which is uh, which is masculine energy and the vine, which is feminine energy. Um, and we just come from two weeks of ayahuasca retreat and then uh, a week of Huachuma San Pedro cactus in Cusco. Um, what's your reflections you found in that space of medicine? Well, I think I touched on them before and it's going to keep bringing me back to this masculine feminine balance because that was really the, the core of what I learned through them. Like, um, I will, I do want to go into psychedelics of a lot of people look at my art and they're like, whoa, you must have psychedelics every day and you like take psychedelics and then you paint. And I'm like, no, dude, like this has been a life path for me. Like I go have a plant medicine journey and learn from it and then I wait like a year like if I'm gonna dive deep into something it's about like integrating this experience right. and like the first time I met ayahuasca she was like thank you for waiting so long like mm -hmm. me and I she's an ally for me it was clearly a medicine that that I was supposed to work with like as soon as I met her it was like hey old friend um mm -hmm. but but it's been really about the journey and like waiting until it's the right time and fully integrating and letting it be a part of your path instead of forcing it, instead of being like, I need to fix this and, and I just don't get burnt out. Like just let it let it come into your life naturally. And right. And have the right intention also. They all for doing have it. yeah, and listen to your deepest gut instinct and you know there are a lot of people out there that you can't trust, and everyone has different people that they can trust. Hi, puppies. Pocha. Pocha. Um, <laughs> but, like, you really have to be a sovereign being. Like, you really have to listen to your deep inner intuition. And if you feel like you can't fully listen to your deep inner intuition, it's probably not time to take plant medicine. It's probably time to, like develop your practice by like eating healthy for a while or fast or meditating and then go to it like plant medicines are strong and if you're going to be on the plant medicine journey it's like a plant medicine journey so like yeah, it's no joke it's no joke so like use don't don't look at it as like the only route to healing it's so important and it's so powerful for so many people but trust yourself over anybody else like don't ever and I think it goes back to you know don't ever give up your power for anyone or anything you know it's and at the same regard we can't have people abusing power we have to check each other right. all the time what's like, your opinion on the importance of a proper shaman or guide for these plant medicine journeys <laughs> Sorry for making you these hard questions at such a hard time. Uh, you know, I, I've never fully trusted a shaman. I have never fully ever trusted. Not even Cucho? No. Really? I've never fully trusted a shaman or ayahuascaro ever. Like, I've been like, this feels okay. 
but but it's but me waxy. and the I'm plant. It's the plant. Like it's my relationship to that plant. It's my life. It's the surroundings. It's the people I'm around. It's how I was brought into it. It's like all these other things. Um, but also like you know. You, you should be able to trust people that claim that they are healers. Like, you should. And maybe that's my own thing of, I'm, you know, I have trust issues, maybe. Well, it seems but like I, you're more... But you're, I trust you're... plants. Like, I trust plants. And I've, I've been in a lot of situations where I've worked for healers and medicine men and visionaries. I've worked for these kind of people my whole life. When I lived in Guatemala, when I lived in Nicaragua, I've worked for so many of these healers and I've loved so many of them and respected them, but I've also like, it, they're, we're humans, we're humans. Yeah, everybody makes mistakes. We're humans. Um, well, I make you this question at a time that we've been disappointed by our uh, own guide and uh, this distrust and I'm that you have. Uh, no, and, and it let seems me like not, it seems let like let me not deter that I am pissed and saddened, and it's like fucking shitty. Yeah, me too. Well, it seems like your distrust. I'm not a distrustful person. I'm a person who like thinks that era is good for some reason, and your distrust seems more uh, logical or there's more reason for it is than say somebody like me who thinks that right is good till I get disappointed and then I get embarrassed on top of it in front of everybody for believing in somebody but uh, I still hope that uh, oh, uh, I still hope that in in the future we can find more guides shamans healers curanderos what you want to call it that uh, that can really work with these plants medicines you know well, why is there more darkness in shamanism let's go to it because it's an abuse of power abusing power that's where we're at in our government i don't want to talk about governments right now but like abusing power is a huge thing and it's it's something that our patriarchal culture has abused power that's part of what we're trying to tear down like people in power we have to stop them from abusing our power. We need natural leaders. We need leaders that are in power because they have a heart of love and they're entrusted. And, and it's just such a shame how people in power have this ability to be sneaky. And Do you think power always will corrupt? It seems like people start with good intentions as soon as they have power they get corrupted, and as soon as they have absolute power, they get absolutely corrupted. Well, That's it's like same. power over how many people? Like, really, I think we should be living in a small village construct to where you live with a small group of people and you all know each other as humans. Like, you know each other. You've had meals together. You can trust that person. How much can you trust someone you've never met? It's so tricky. Like... What, through their social media persona, you're supposed to trust someone? Right. Like, how much can you really trust someone that you haven't hugged or you haven't shared a meal or you haven't, like... And the people that dupe you that you have done that to, that's, that's evil that needs to be worked out. Like, the people that are able to sway you in that when you have known them, like, that's just... That's the, that's the scary side of humanity, you know? And so what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me, Ashley, how do we find the good people? All I can do is try to be a good person myself, and I'm as flawed as any other person, too. And, uh, yeah, but we're... I'm, I'm I mean, all we can do is be transparent well. and be the best people that we can be and speak up if you feel uncomfortable and speak your truth and and talk to your friends and talk to your community and support each other and love each other and don't be selfish and hmm. all right so we're at a time of a female power revival fuck yeah right fuck yeah and you are part of this crew called the Vis Visionary Muses. The Visionary Muses. So tell me a little bit about what that is. 
Um, the Visionary Muses have been this beautiful collective of 11 women, and we met, um, three of us met in Peru, um, and it unfolded kind of right when Corona started. I want to name them all right now, and I'm scared to miss one. Just miss, name a couple. Ma name those first three that you met um, on my retreat. Ariani and the Matotonist and Elisa, Vasilisa Art. And then we have Stella and um, Kale. Kaylee Collinson, <laughs> Emily Kell, Dome Moon, Sarah Vaccarilio, um... Um, Adrian, Tamar, Arachne, Olivia. Did I say Olivia? I don't think so, no. I'm missing two, and this is on the spot. Why are you doing uh, this to me? Karen. Karen Charles yeah. is her birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Karen. Happy birthday. Um, so long, we're missing. And I'm number 11. Okay, great. Hey. <laughs> I, I, I mean, this group of women has been so monumental in this past year. It was right when Corona started and we just started painting. So we drew names out of a hat and we all started painting each other. Um, and so we each did a visionary muse portrait of the other one. And it was all just about female empowerment and seeing, like really seeing a woman. And for me, you know, I do like more of energetic channeling. So it was like really seeing another woman in her power because women have been like almost put against each other in a way. Like there's this competitive edge because we're trying to like compete with this dark patriarchal system. So women are trying to be like competitive when it's not in our nature at all. We're here to like hold each other and rise each other up and love each other. Um, so it's been so beautiful to have this kind of collective of women. Um, we just opened our show on the Vision Train, and it's, yeah, the Visionary Muses. Um, it's the first time a lot of us, or at least half of us, have painted portraits. So I think it, it, for me it was like, you know, using your art to raise up another human. Like, how beautiful is that and how empowering? <laughs> the dogs. <laughs> he wants to be in. Um, um, so in this whole situation of female empowerment, you raise each other up, but you're also talking about bringing down this patriarchal structure. Um, does that mean you're against men in any way? I know the answer to this, obviously, but no. explain a little bit, like, you know, what's, what's in, in the rise of female power, what's your attitude towards male, uh, masculine power? Well, they've abused the shit out of it, but... Every man that I have gotten to know deeply has some serious sexual trauma and wounding. And it's impossible for me to not have that in the picture. And I think so many women have been hurt by so many men. And it's, it's terrible and we need to bring that out. But I do think the next wave of this is how many men have sexual trauma. And whether it's from their parents or from... You know, I can't touch on where it comes from, but I think that's the next wave of this. And, and men need to, you know, talk to each other, too, and support each other and support women first. And then they need to support each other. And right. and this there needs to be a floor for men to talk about their sexual wounding and their sexual trauma. And um, right. we all need a floor. Yeah, that. we're all humans. We're all yeah. sensitive. Um I know as a man, I got my own sexual traumas that are sometimes harder to bring to the light because men are supposed to be strong and men are not supposed to have these issues. And you can talk it to your female friends and they can have some empathy, but they don't really get you because they're not actually men. And if you bring it up with a dude, they might make fun of you or, you know, or they might not empathize or they w just might not want to talk about it at all. And there's really few sensitive men that I can find and speak about these things. Like the well, and it's also like, you know, your age and culturally, like, mm -hmm. it, I think it's coming more into light. And I see, you know, kids, there's so many movements that have happened in the past, like, five years with, with 
gender identity and gender fluidity that have really started to break this down. And I also recognize that there's a lot of new terminology and there's a lot of new ways of speaking about these things that get harder to be unified because it's, it's a constantly evolving conversation. Right. Um, and to stay on top of it can be really tricky. And so I think... Yeah, as a, as a, as a guy who's in his 40s, who was born in the 70s, I feel pretty clueless about the new terms and the new protocol. Well, but you get less excuses because you're a public, you're a figure. And so you, it's your responsibility to research this stuff. And now, you know, it's your responsibility to like, no. And it's also, you well, know. Well, it's, I wouldn't say I get less excuses. I get more shit when I get it wrong because more I'm under the gun, under the, the microscope well, more for as a public person. Your gut reaction was wrong. Your gut reaction was wrong, and that reveals a, a, mis, a shadow. It re, it's a shadow, and it's a misguided. Your gut reaction was wrong, and, and that is what it is. And we've all been, it, it happens, you know? Like, it happens. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I've seen you. <laughs> <laughs> You've okay. so proven yourself, and it's so hard for me to even transmit on here, but... I mean, come on, like, what is it to, to see someone on social media and to, and to spend time with a person? Like, social media is a strange beast. It's a whole strange beast. And I really, really hope, and it's a way to abuse power, and it's a way to spread healing energy. And it's just such a, a new thing that we're all trying to freaking figure out. And... I just really hope that it can be used for the highest path of healing and transformation and doesn't be used for disillusion and and power struggles and fame and fortune, which that's always going to be the dark side. But I surely hope in our painting and our visionary art community, if anywhere on freaking social media, like, please, man. Well, you know that I've our always tried to use my social our, media. It, to, this isn't as about you. This is about the whole community. Right. Well, I'm, I, I can only speak for myself as the person that I am. Whatever I've amassed social media wise, I've always used it as a way for spreading my medicine, for empowering my friends, for just spreading the good word of like, let's make the world a better place. And even with my uh, shortcomings or blind spots or miscommunications or... Uh, you know, people having different opinions that your own. The intention was always good. And uh, as soon as I made a, a big mistake or, you know, as you said, like I, my gut feeling was the wrong one because I was just uh, in the wrong place or misinformed or I just don't really get the, the, the feeling situation, then the whole social media crushed on me. Well, I think people thought it was like this hidden nugget of like dark character. Like you expose this like really dark, side of yourself and we I mean we all have a dark we all have some darkness that needs to be brought to the light and we all have those moments of darkness but do you have to be punished by the whole well, community but your the difference exercise. is that you know 200,000 people have witnessed your dark moment and that's that's your responsibility and that's your <sighs> So you think I deserve to be punished? <laughs> no, I think it's all part of your healing journey. I think it's a part of your healing journey, and that's just that you're serving as a, you're serving as an opening for a lot of people to think twice, a lot of men to think twice about what they say and how they say it, and and that in itself, even though you, you, I hope that that gave an opening to a lot of people because a lot of positivity came from it and a lot of negativity came from it. And it's just all a part of the healing path. We're all just in this for healing. We're not in this to be popular and to do... We're all just in it to, like, do the best we can and heal the most we can and bring the most love. And Right. Well, I'm happy that whatever mistakes I might have done, you know, or, you know, suffering that was brought upon me because of it, if it serves to um, 
serve as an example for other guys of what not to do but and to bring some teaching healing. moment for yourself oh like, yeah hell yeah, yeah. i've like learned to a lot show gratitude for it and be like shit like uh, yeah okay. no i'm great i'm grateful i'm, okay, hap I'm, like, I'm happy but you know like i wish i didn't have to like go through like so many fingers coming down on me and be like Rrr. but you know that's the world and that's also my lesson of knowing that hey i know i'm a good person and even if when i make mistakes i still gotta know that i'm a good person and that the fingers that others point at me shouldn't dictate how i observe myself too you know because i'm like we all we all deserve a, a day or two I mean, self, where we make mistakes you know self-love i mean you have to have self-love like where else where would you be without I mean, that's the core of it all right it's, it's self-love and all right so my next question is a very important one What's the recipe for a Play-Doh cookie? What? What's the recipe for a Play-Doh cookie? A Play-Doh cookie? Yeah. <laughs> um, that orange color that's like, <laughs> that orangey like red pink color. Do you know what I'm talking about? That was my favorite. It's like still my favorite. Color. They were very I salty. still think of play-doh when i think of that like orange red vibrant uh play-doh you put it in your paintings <laughs> that's for sure tell me a little bit about the north carolina scene you're from north carolina there's a little bit of a art scene there there's a it's a huge i mean we are an epic crew in Asheville. i think the Asheville art scene is growing so much and we're a little bit more humble um i think we're kind of like more we're like the gnomes, you know? We're kind of like more in our in our homes and I think some of us have been less like business savvy in a way. We're more like earth-centered kind of um, folks, but just down to earth, loving, beautiful community of people in Asheville. I'm so grateful for my Asheville art friends. Um, should I do an Asheville artist shout out right now? It's up to you. Uh, if you can remember them all without feel feeling guilty for who you leave out. Yeah, I mean, we have Gavin Gavinger and Jerry Cahill and Kaylee Collinson and Kyle Marstrea and Sweet Melissa and Ryan O'Sullivan. Um, just really solid, beautiful. And I'm sure I did leave someone out, but I still wanted to throw some love to that whole community um nice well i know a few of those people and i love them already yeah so annie I, and jack and dylan and um yeah it's just it's a beautiful community and i think we were all like traveling on the road and doing festivals a bunch uh so we didn't really have as much time to connect and i i think now i think everyone feels this way especially people that were doing festivals i mean i worked for five years, I was traveling with my booth um, from festival to festival and setting it up, and I was just drained. Like, I was connecting with so many people at every event that it was just like, who? So to have this year at home and, like, painting with a few friends and really being able to um, tap into that and knowing, you know, your tribe getting to know your tribe and your art friends and the festival scene is beautiful and I can't wait for it to start again but also it was I think important times for us all to kind of reel it in figure out what's important we can go back to that kind of scene with so much more consciousness and like think about thinking about just like being in a space with that many people at one time and how much you just let your energy fly around and you're like whoa and Versus coming together again and being more conscious and being more tuned into each other and more respectful of each other and listening more. It's the same lesson that keeps circling through our conversation of just like listening and mm -hmm. listening and being more balanced and trying to have everyone be heard and trying to rise each other up. And nice. Yeah. Well, I hope uh, to visit you guys out in North Carolina. Yeah, come soon. And hopefully people don't hate me because of my big mistake. No, we will we will welcome you with open arms. Thank you. Can't Appreciate wait to it. have you there. Nice, thank you. Yeah. Um, so we're coming to the end of our show. It's been a lovely conversation. We have some final words of wisdoms to our millions and millions of viewers watching us from all around the world. 
You threw me so many curveballs. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> like, I think it's important to talk about these issues. Yeah, I'm, I'm really you know. glad. And, you know, I also realize that I'm an impassioned person and I get really passionate about something. And that's something within myself to, like, um, I have a lot of messages I want to shoot out and shoot out and, like, share emotion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the puppies are and sometimes it's about, like, shh. Like, what do I really want to say? Like, what what is what is the core of what I'm trying to say here? And like, how can I say it from like the peace of my heart? And how can I have passion and explosion and excitement for the world and excitement for adventure? Because I'm an adventurous person. Like, I want to go out there with passion and like live life to the fullest and like adventure. But I don't want to do it so much to where I lose like the specialness of just like being with the people that are close to you and being with yourself alone and being in meditation and just being at peace with yourself. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the balance, you know, like keeping that spark and that passion and that adventure alive so that we can expand, expand the outer world, but also having that peace and that calm and that centeredness to expand the inner world and being able to have balance those those two expanding together and that's like a balance of power that's a balance of everything we're talking about you know and mm -hmm. um yeah. i don't know if this guy actually changed because i said that but as soon it's as all, like, as soon as i had some like inner peace uh, for a minute everything just like seems more aligned so the dog stock barking yeah well thank you so much for being my guest on this podcast uh, thank you for coming to my home and hanging out with my parents and uh, doing this mural for me, but mostly for being my friend in general, but also mostly for being a, 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 my friend at probably my most uh, difficult week of my life. Uh, it's been the most terrible, saddest week of my life, and you were a person who stood by me was a friend despite your friends being like what the fuck are you doing with this guy who's this or that based on uh social media opinions uh it means a lot to me that when friends are truly friends uh, on the highs and on the lows so thank you so much yeah thank you so much for i mean we've been through a lot these past three weeks we we're transforming into new beings <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Machu Picchu and the jungle and being at your home, and it's just been a journey, and I feel like I've gotten to see your real heart, and, you know, that, and clearly we have, yeah, there's paths with people, and they're here to show you different lessons, so I'm really grateful to have shared this. And we annoy each other oh, yeah. quite enough. <laughs> oh, I call you out, and I, we can call each other out on our bullshit, and, and we can be real. you all the time, and I still love you. <laughs> Same, same for you, man. Yeah, we, I mean, that's real friendship. You can call each other out on your bullshit. You can be real, and you can also show love, and right. that's what it's all about. Totally. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. You love rule. Love you, Chris. I love you, too. And uh, I love you, too, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Chris Dyer's Creative Friends. Please like, share, comment, whatever you want. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next week. Blessings! The hold of the insanity of what I call the old story of what the world is, what's real and who I am, the hold of that is so strong that without some dramatic intervention, most people carry that to their dying day or their dying weeks. Um, to loosen that hold, it does take either the imminence of death, which clears away, you know, what is true and what is false, what is real and what is permanent and unreal and impermanent, right? That death is the ultimate medicine. But usually when you are close to death, you're not going to actually be out in the world doing very much unless you have a near death experience, you know, or something like that. Okay. So, um, Death, the, the, the invasion of the consciousness of death into life is one of the, maybe the most powerful psychedelic medicine.
So make sure to subscribe, like, and everything else. Big thanks and see you next week. Peace.